I'll do a quick intro. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, this is yet another fabulous guest speaker and I'm very excited to invite Peter Katerjinski. Uh, he is one of the, I would say the top guy I know of in block threat Intel and uh, very excited to hear what he has to say today. Definitely a unique view on things. So take it away, Peter. Thank you. Yeah, I'd really hope to share some of the craft and uh, things I've been exploring for the last few years in the blockchain security space. And we'll talk through the field of threat intelligence and how it applies to uh, what you will be doing, either on defensive side or if you're going to be on like auditor, offensive side, how you can enhance uh, your work. So, uh, in case we have not met, uh, thanks for the intro about the newsletter. I highly recommend you check out the blockthread.io just to stay on top of, it's basically a free newsletter. You can stay on top of all major compromises, but even more interestingly, uh, research articles, again, in blockchain security uh, space, uh, major events, uh, compromises, um, uh, vulnerabilities discovered, and so on. So professionally, I'm a full-time threat intelligence uh, researcher at Coinbase. And my background that got me into this field, uh, I used to be a, a reverse engineer, so looking at malware all day, nation-state malware for the most part, at Mandiant, and also as a pen tester auditor at the much more centralized field at the Federal Reserve Bank. Um, so what is threat intelligence? Threat intelligence is the source of actionable and actionable is in bold for a reason. Actionable truth on adversary tactics, techniques, and procedures. Uh, this, the latter is usually abbreviated as TTP, so you'll see that a lot. What does that mean? Like, we don't want to just provide information about what is going on in the field. We wanna make sure that you can take that and be able to immediately apply it for uh, securing of your projects or enhancing whatever security work that you're doing. So what does that entail on the blockchain side? <clears throat> well, for one, uh, it's important to keep track of all the incidents, every compromise, every hack, there's a new pattern, there's a new tidbit that you can analyze, classify, how do they compromise something? Um, how do they act um, and so on? Uh, this is the analysis portion. So we don't want to just enumerate and say, oh, uh, some bridge got compromised because they failed to do uh, some kind of proof verification and then be done with it. No, we want everything. We want to know what are the helper contracts that the attackers prefer? Uh, where do they get their money to initially fund gas? Is it coming from Tornado? Is it coming from something else? How do they swap the assets once they're stolen? Do they prefer curve over Uniswap and do they prefer a particular pool? This is the level of minute detail that we're talking about. And of course, tracking the flow of funds. So we want to know where are the stolen assets going for all those uh, incidents. And those are also a great source of um, uh, intelligence. And of course, making all of this actionable. It's not enough to just aggregate and combine all of the uh, indicators and just say, oh, well, just read this report. Like, no, you have to dissect it, make sure that you talk to the right people. Um, so for example, if in case of a bridge compromise, I want to make sure that when I inform uh, bridges that were compromised, hey, like this is, this is what happened. This is what we see from our perspective. And these are the techniques uh, that attackers used and maybe tell other bridges so they can look at their security practices and maybe protect themselves ahead of time. Uh, so that's the blockchain application of threat intelligence. And the reason why, like what, why are we spending all this time creating you know, all this data? And quite simply is that one is uh, for defensive side. Uh, how do you know what to defend against if you don't know how uh, other similar projects are getting attacked? And then if you even you do know how things are attacked, how do you prioritize? What do you protect first? Do you protect your web services and dApps or do you spend all your time and resource on smart contracts? 
But maybe you need to think about where you store your private keys. Uh, it's hard to tell what to focus on and what to, if you become an auditor, what to advise your, um, or your clients, or if you're on the defensive side, well, how, do you, uh, how do you prioritize the limited time that you have, what to defend? If you don't know how things are actually getting exploited out there. Um, again, if you're an auditor, it's also very useful in terms of simulating, uh, simulating adversaries. Um, so on the one hand, if you're an auditor, the company is hiring you to make sure that you try to, in the limited time that you have, uh, you try to find all the low-hanging fruits. But what are those low-hanging fruits? Is it just something that you have seen from your experience? Or should you focus on things that are used for the most damaging compromises out there? So in, in part, companies hire you so you can simulate what an adversary would do before the real bad guys show up. Uh, and having threat intelligence uh, databases like that, knowledge bases, uh, allows you to, to perform that. So you'll do what the bad guys would do before, uh, before they show up. And another part of blockchain threat intelligence is that it can be used to actually disrupt bad actors. We can, by knowing and understanding how they operate, uh, what infrastructure they use, uh, we can actually reach out and try to stop them. We can talk to exchanges where the stolen assets uh, end up on. We can talk to any other uh, resources that they use as part of their attacks. Um, and try to disrupt them. This is more related to things like phishing attacks, uh, you, you know, the airdrop campaigns that people do. Uh, if we learn more and more how they operate, we can forewarn and block list them potentially um, before they, they can do real damage. Uh, any questions so far on blockchain threat intelligence? Okay. I, I guess I'm I'm Go gonna ahead. throw one in. Will you will you talk later what the uh, simulating adversaries uh, means? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, Great. I can give you like a preview. So you, um, what that means is so from like traditional security. Uh, whenever so there are auditors and then there are red teams. Uh, when you hire auditor, you make sure that there's a certain set of categories which are um, which are covered. Uh, when you hire red teams, you really want them to simulate exactly what attackers would do. So, I mean, in the, again, in traditional security, that means going as wild and crazy as trying to uh, crawl through your air ducts to get into the office where the private keys are sitting or something, something really wild. In terms of blockchain, you want to simulate attackers doing things like, hey, they're setting up their, they're moving assets from Tornado Cash and they're setting up a smart contract and the smart contract is configured to target your project. And then there's some logic inside that helper contract, which probably does some kind of re-entrancy. It keeps on calling the same thing over and over again. So you don't just like show, again, you do this all offline. You show like, uh, I use Foundry for my simulations. Um, you don't do this live on chain. Obviously, I hope, uh, but you can show uh, your customers and say, hey, like this is what an attacker would do. Um, just because we found that bug, I also want you to learn how they operate. So maybe like if you want to write some kind of detection or monitoring, or you want to write some kind of error generation uh, on, on your side, this is what you would look for. This is how you would react to similar attacks. Does that make sense? Yeah, that was great. Thanks. So beyond beyond just checkboxes, like, oh, I just went through this nice list and now we're done, Good, goodbye. Like you really are educating folks on like how do the bad guys operate? Okay, any other questions? All right. Um, and again, the, the beauty of our field is the, the blockchain security field is so that we can tap an immense um, library of things that people have been doing for traditional web two security, if you want to call it, and we can apply it and modify it as necessary for this new domain. Um, 
So we don't need to reinvent a lot of things. We just need to be clever at how we apply it. So with that, let's jump into a case study. I'll walk you through my typical workday of how we analyze um, compromises, what information we extract, how we simulate the attackers, adversaries, and so on. So a great case study is Nomad Bridge Compromise from a few months ago. So if just to refresh your memory, Nomad Bridge Compromise happened on August 1st. Um, $186 million were stolen as a result of vulnerability in bridge message verification logic. So whenever, whenever something like this happens, for the most part, the, the beginning of the incident is a transaction. So we say, hey, like this, uh, so I just sent uh, 1.7 million uh, wrapped Bitcoin. Uh, what the heck? Is this a compromise? What's going on? So you're, this is the beginning of your journey. You start, you track down uh, a suspicious transaction. Uh, and again, like if you're uh, on a defense side, and you get an alert saying, hey, it's like someone just transferred a whole bunch of money from my project. This is where your journey begins. And from there, for the most part, we look at like, what is the four bytes? What is the method that was actually called on my contract, which is potentially vulnerable? Or if you don't see it in the actual transaction, there's probably like a helper contract. So you would load up uh, Tenderly or Sam's uh, new uh, transaction analyzer and just find out what is actually called on your side. And from there, your job is to really understand what was that payload, how to decode it. So in the case of the Nomad bridge hack, uh, for the most part, like you don't, you don't have, um, uh, Etherscan is great in terms of decoding a lot of the um, trans uh, transaction code data. Sometimes you have to do just a little bit more work. And what I like doing for my analysis, I just do this kind of color coding and break down every single byte that I can see to, to its components. So I'm not missing any detail. And oftentimes it's an overkill because uh, just, just to understand a transaction, uh, so just to understand the exploit, it, it may not be necessary, but in terms of understanding the attacker, where did they mess up? Maybe they reused that transaction from somewhere else, or maybe they sent that uh, transaction and they were testing something ahead of time, which was the case uh, with Nomad. Um, that's really useful. So every byte needs to be accounted for. So in this case, I would say like, okay, this is a bridging message. There's a sender, like where I'm sending it to. There's a bridge router, uh, a nonce. That's, those are excellent. Like those kind of like randomized but user selectable things are great indicators. Um, and then message body. So then you go next level or there's another transaction related to it. You try to decode it as well. And then we get to the meat, which is, this is the payload that the attacker embedded. That was the message body. And then we can see, oh, they're like bridging something from Moonbeam to ETH. And uh, they're basically requesting a withdrawal. Uh, details hash, so you have to decode this as well. It'll just stand for wrap Bitcoin and so on. Uh, so this is the level of detail that we go into. And then from there, you walk backwards and say, okay, so I understand the payload. I understand what they actually sent. Where does that hidden code? And then hopefully <laughs> you have source code available. So I'll, I'll, that's why I'm giving you this a simpler example, but oftentimes you're dealing with compiled uh, with contracts with no source code on uh, Etherscan. So you have to spend, again, more time with the decompiler. So I prefer DDoPS, uh, smart contract library, uh, but then there are plenty of resources out there. Sometimes you have to, we have no choice but to go to just EVM opcodes and try to figure out what's going on there. Um, but in this case, it's a, there's, there was no helper contract for this transaction and the attacker simply triggered uh, this requirement method. So they, they somehow bypassed this line which required that the message is, the proof that they submitted is okay. And then start walking back like, okay, so there's a requirement. Where does the requirement go to? Well, it goes to another function which is acceptable root. 
and that acceptable root does some kind of lookup for in a confirm at map. So they're forwarding this user control message all the way to this map. That's what times, and then it returns somehow true, even though the attacker just claimed, uh, you know, whole bunch of wrapped Bitcoin, uh, which they were not supposed to. And that's when we start playing. So again, I'm a big fan of Foundry. Um, so this is cast. I use that a lot to do live, live uh, lookups. Um, so I started investigating like what's, what's in this map? How was it initialized? Um, so I noticed that at, at a time that this contract was initialized, somehow it got triggered and there was a value set at zero value to one. And if you, if you fast forward in time, sorry, if you roll back time, you can see like when this contract was first established, first deployed, there was this line when you first initialized it to said committed root to one. And it just so happened that the, at the constructor time, committed root was simply set to zero. So you can imagine that if you're submitting invalid proof, so I'm walking back a little bit, this confirm at value right here would return a valid number for a root, which would be zero for an invalid root, which is not found. So this message is message hash that I'm submitting. If it's an invalid value, then it would return zero. So we're sending zero into acceptable root. And then once we do lookup, because of this unfortunate uh, uh, course of events, it would return a valid uh, non-zero value, which would allow us to accept uh, this acceptable root would return a true statement. Uh, is, is everyone familiar with the vulnerability? Can I walk through it more or so far so good? Okay, feel free to reach out. And I also point to our uh, much more detailed blog post that dissects this whole thing. This is where the real fun begins, is that one, we want to make sure that we understand how this exploit works. So uh, usually that involves writing a proof of concept code in, uh, in Foundry. Uh, so <laughs> we, we really want to simulate every single step the attacker did. If there are helper contracts, we'll build the exact helper contract. If they're doing like some kind of flash loan, we do flash loans for the exact amount from the exact addresses. This is where the cheat codes in the Foundry are really useful because you can just say, hey, I'm now I'm an attacker. And I can basically replicate the entire uh, transaction flow as, as the bad guys do. In this case, it was kind of funny. We, we got it to a point where we were stealing assets better than the attackers. Like they left a lot. Uh, they, they didn't steal as much as they could have. So we're just like making sure. And that's also another clue. Like, why didn't they optimize their exploit? Why did they replay some, maybe they just replayed an existing transaction, which offers us clues over who they are, and how they operate. Uh, highly recommend you adopt Foundry for understanding the exploits. Um, and then the real fun begins, the hunt. The hunt is based on all the indicators that we collected based on uh, our understanding of the exploit, understanding of how attackers operate, we see where the money moves and how it moves. So this is an example. We use um, uh, Dune Analytics for a lot of things, just to query block on-chain data, uh, make advanced uh, things like, hey, like what, what tokens were stolen from the bridge? What was the frequency, time analysis? Do they operate at night or they, do they operate during the daytime hours? Uh, what time zone they operate in, what transactions, where does the money go? This is, this is the fun stuff. Uh, this was our analysis based on, we try to, in case of a nomad, because of how, uh, unfortunately, like this, this thing was exposed to everyone. Once the vulnerability was uh, showed up on chain, it felt like the entire ecosystem just ran at the poor nomad contract and started extracting Funds. The same thing happened with Anchor uh, more like a few weeks ago when the attacker uh, deployed a minting function. And again, like once people saw you can steal or mint assets, everyone jumped on it. So we're, we're trying to do classification and try to understand like who are the original attackers, who are the copycats, and so on. Um, and of course, a good old on-chain tracking, just 
watching where is the money going. So oftentimes uh, they go to tornado. We try to understand like where is it going, see through the tornado, um, tornado cash, where that money is probably ending up um, and just to look for any other patterns. And the final outcome is, well, one is the list of indicators. So these are the addresses belonging to attackers or core attackers. Uh, techniques, we document them. So they use, so we will document, say, hey, like this attacker likes to use Tornado. They use or do not use helper contracts. They prefer the use of, let's say, Uniswap for swapping assets. Um, they like stable coins, like in case of a, a, a Binance hack, they, they prefer to move their liquidity off chain by first converting it to stable coins, then swapping them, observe how quickly they operate. So uh, I mean, another hack, like the, I mentioned Binance hack, like, oh my God, they were like every minute, they knew exactly what they were doing. They're just very fast. Um, th that tells you a lot, like same with Anchor, like you watch the first attacker and how they operate. And it was like every minute, like, boom, boom, boom. They knew exactly what they were doing. And then you have copycats and you just watch them stumble all over. You have like failed transactions all over the place. So you can, you can get a sense of who you're dealing with. Um, and aggregate this, this for all for like a complete picture of who, do, like who are we dealing with, how they operate and so on. Um, and then in terms of actionable intelligence, uh, when you can see publicly, um, so from Coinbase perspective, like we publish blogs, so Nomad Bridge incident analysis, basically any major compromise, we try to make sure that we document it and share knowledge that we gained. Um, basically everything that you've seen. So not just what the exploit is and what the vulnerability is, um, but also like who, who's operating, how, um, any notes about their behavior, just so we can just help the industry a little bit um, to get this holistic view on the compromise so we can learn. Um, before I jump into DeFi attack vectors, any questions on just the day-to-day -day craft Can I ask if you have any, uh, shall we say, top secret internal tools or the stuff you've shown so far, like Foundry and Dune Analytics? It seems like, uh, I mean, in theory, others have access to anything on chain too. Yeah. So uh, nothing too secret. Nothing too secret. Uh, look, like this is <laughs> this is such a new field. Um, I think even if there are secret tools, they were not developed yet. I think as we go through uh, as we go through this and we learn, really start learning about these attacks, there are a lot of ideas on what to look for. Um, but again, we're like at the very beginning, we are in the 19, late 1990s now of like what Web2 web security was. So we're, we're just about to start building all those things. But Dune Analytics, Etherscan, Foundry, um, we have our internal uh, Coinbase tracer that we use, uh, but any any on-chain transaction uh, monitoring tool, a transaction tracking tool would work. So chain analysis, elliptics, you name it, TRM, um, yeah. So yeah, for the most part, I think you will notice quickly that all of these tools are limited and you will start writing a lot of Python scripts and a lot of uh, Dune queries, just, uh, just because of their limitation especially once you get into like cross chain bridging, uh, like you have to decode the transaction, like what chain are they ending up on? Like, okay, you have to, again, expand the call data, see like where that ends up, understand how bridges work and then dealing with uh, like any swaps, all that requires just more custom work, which doesn't exist because these protocols, a lot of them were born a few months ago and attackers are already using them. So like, all those existing tools didn't uh, adapt to them yet. Any other questions? So we have one question in the Zoom oh. chat. I'll repeat it for everyone on the recording. Uh, so for transaction volume alerts, do you use custom scripts or services like Forta bots? Forta is great. Um, 
transaction volume alerts. So transaction volume alerts are, are hard. So uh, Florida bots are a great indicator. Um, whale watcher and so on. The difficulty, like you really want to be building those um, high volume alerts specific for a project. And you have to be also smart about it because there's just going to be a lot of noise. So uh, what I would do is for custom scripts to implement is one, detect high volume coming in and out of your project, but then see the additional indicators. Are we dealing with tornadoes somewhere down the line? Are we dealing with some suspicious address? And by suspicious, like were they involved in other compromises or did they just show up out of nowhere and they just got funded by tornado? Things like that. Uh, that will cut down on noise a lot. And unfortunately, it will still require custom scripting. And again, like the, the idea of Florida is that make, um, make those things generic enough so that we can all reuse them and not try to reinvent the wheel every time. So any other questions? Okay, well, uh, we talked about blockchain threat intelligence the practice of it. We talked to a typical day in the uh, block, block threat analyst uh, uh, flow, workflow. Um, and let's talk about some outcomes that you can apply for what you're going to do in the future. Uh, one, one thing that I felt was missing for a long time is kind of some kind of listing of OWASP top 10 or even top five of attack vectors that we should care about from attacker or auditor perspective. Uh, so if you're in a web two world, you know, okay, like look for XSS, look for SQL injection. There's a set list of things I need to focus on. There's a, if you, if you look at the entire directory of all the things, all the different ways people get hacked, it's very hard to um, prioritize and focus your time. Like uh, if you're an auditor, you really maybe have a week. So what are you going to spend that week on? Are you going to, test their, um, I don't know, how they deploy their contracts or are you gonna focus on something smart contract specific or even supporting like private keys? Like where do you get that intelligence? So that's what I wanted to share with you is just an overview of how do projects get hacked and give you those ideas for prioritization. In terms of total hacks and losses, what I keep track of is uh, DeFi, blockchain, CFI, so centralized, ex centralized finance, it's exchanges and like other centralized businesses and individual compromises. So far, oh my God, it's December and I keep on ad adjusting the slide because <laughs> more and more things get hacked every day. So far, and I hope this stays this way, uh, we saw about 3 billion, more than 3 billion now uh, in, stolen assets on the DeFi side, blockchain compromises. So that's, we're talking about like 51% attacks and um, reorgs and all that good stuff like VM exploits. So vulnerable, like people are exploiting like uh, vulnerable VM implementations, only $114 million. Like if you were in this industry a couple of years ago, all you could hear about was like 51% attacks every day. Exchanges are getting, losing, hundreds and hundreds of millions today, like relative to the overall losses, it's like hundred million. So when you, when you focus your attention, like should I worry about on-chain attacks like that? Probably, but after you're done with DeFi. Same with uh, centralized. So for centralized finance projects, so uh, exchanges, they're still huge. And that 508 number grew recently thanks to FTX. Uh, shenanigans after someone uh, started moving, was it 380 million? So it was still a lot smaller than what it was before, but you have those weird events, like uh, I guess like FTX thing sounds like it's an insider threat. So you do want to advise your clients not like, hey, like have you thought about insider threat? That was, uh, that was how FTX seems to have been compromised. So make sure that you have proper logging, access controls and so on. An individual like, that's mostly private key theft. So really like when you're dealing about all the different 
uh, things in the space. Like DeFi is just dominating. It's insane just how just how many incidents we're dealing with. Um, so from there, what we can do is we can just say, okay, uh, we've been classifying every single compromise, every single hack. So if you look at my newsletter, every single week I publish like who got hacked, how much they lost, and what was the exploitation vector. So this is the aggregate for 2022. And if we just go by monetary losses, I mean, st stolen private keys is still way up there. And that's your, um, I want to think, uh, those be a Ronin, like those couple of bridge compromises, which were attributed to uh, uh, North Korean uh, groups. They, you know, just massive theft of assets due to good old private key compromises. Uh, signature proof validation. So a lot of those are just, uh, so what bumped that up a lot was the recent Binance um, uh, BSC token hub compromise. So that's that's where most of the 600 million is coming from. And then you have your very popular price oracle, manipulation, function parameter. We'll dive into a few of those in a bit. Uh, but the point is just, this is just one way to look at it. It's just like what results in the most left out there. What about the frequency? And the frequency will instruct us uh, what is the likelihood of, it's going, of it happening to your project. So the most frequent way that projects get compromised, even though it's not as, in, in total, it's not as uh, uh, painful, but it's price oracle manipulation. So that's your, I'm trying to think, uh, like Nereos compromise where they included spot prices and the way they calculated the price oracle uh, data. And that was easy to manipulate with flash loans. Most of them follow like a similar pattern there. Uh, function access control, like people keep on deploying contracts and not setting sufficient access controls. So people just call, um, um, oh, I see a question. Does this number include front running and sandwich attacks? So that's, it's a, the MEV stuff is simply fascinating. I'm not tracking them as security exploits, but it could be like the victims of front running and sandwich attacks are usually users. Um, it could be its own category. I'm not sure how to classify this yet, but it's a, it's a fascinating thing to watch. I'm not sure. Um, I don't think they're reported as much as like, you know, price Oracle was manipulated and someone stole, uh, emptied the pool. Um, so yeah, so those numbers do not include it, but definitely something to look out for. Um, so going back to the incidents by count, um, let's see, so reward manipulation. So again, like simple bugs of how, like if you're like a, if you're working with a, like some kind of farming protocol, like how do they calculate rewards? Can you gain that? Um, like if you recall like ape coin, when they, when they allow people to mint ape based on how many uh, NFTs they have, they didn't account for like, oh, you can actually flash loan NFT apes and then game the system. Like that, they didn't account for that. Stolen private keys is still there. Like there are 16 instances so far this year. Uh, function parameter reentrancy is still on this list. It's wild. Like reentrancy is like the OG of attack vectors still pops up. Logic errors. Uh, more incorrect reward uh, vulnerabilities, weak private keys. So that refers for the most part to the profanity uh, uh, vulnerabilities. So uh, once projects started generating uh, keys using this tool, basically, I hope like if, if the first thing you should probably ask based on this list, have you used profanity to generate anything in your environment? And if they do immediately start working on uh, migrating uh, those keys and anything that is controlled by those keys. Um, and then you have interesting uh, attackers like DNS hijacking, also DGP hijacking. So we wrote about it for uh, more recently. I think it was the seller compromise that was the BGP hijack. So you're thinking on multiple domains here. Like on the one hand, you're thinking like, oh, let's go after uh, smart contracts. We're going to look for a cool reentrancy and logic error bugs. But then you have Things like who's doing your private private key access control? Who is managing your private keys? How are they generated? Are you using some weird flawed tools? 
to generate those private keys? How's your multi-sig looking? And then the last one here is the DNS hijacking. That's completely outside of Web3 world. So you have dependencies on traditional internet infrastructure and you need to take that into account. If your DAP is redirected somewhere it's not supposed to be, um, at best, your, a few of your users will be, will be uh, compromised. At worst, if, it's, if you have some kind of admin panel or something similar, now your developers are getting compromised as well. Um, so what we can do next is take the, fir the first the look at the monetary losses and incident count, just come up with just five. Like 10 is a lot, let's just come up with five. And this is the overlap between the frequency and I consider the likelihood that a project is gonna be attacked with that attack vector and the monetary losses. So we already talked about stolen private keys. And again, when you think about, um, I'm going to look for ways that my private keys are gonna get stolen. Think of who your adversaries are. You're not dealing with some you know, attacker who is a lone wolf with limited resources. In many cases for stolen private keys, uh, a nation state, North Korea was implicated as someone who was involved in those compromises. So think of an attacker with un basically unlimited resources trying to steal your private keys. Uh, price oracle manipulation, look at it like a hawk. I mean, this is, at least on this list, it appears second with $225 million lost. But just because price oracles, like any, anything off chain or anything price calculation is just really hard. So spend some more time writing tests, um, like looking for those edge cases, like any weird tokens that you're dealing with, any, any edge case that you can find where this could be manipulated. I mean, in we and then you have a, uh, like we're thinking of price oracle manipulation in terms of um, so years is one example, but look at what happened to Ave most recently. There was an attempt to manipulate prices there, and that left Ave with some bad debt as a result. So I would say, I guess the attack was failed, but it still freaked everyone out. Like, is this really a new attack vector that we should be worried about? Function parameter validation, uh, weak private keys we talked about. So uh, please ask your uh, whoever you're working with, like, did you use profanity? And then good old reentrancy. Like all of these could be could have been prevented this year, but unfortunately, that's where a lot of this three billion dollar uh, losses could have been could have been not there. So maybe if we focus on those five, like I'm counting, like maybe. 1.5 billion could have been saved. So that's what I want to leave you with. Um, just take this list for your defenses, take this list for your audits. Maybe this will help you prioritize things. If you're, especially if you're strapped on time, don't spend all your time trying to find esoteric bugs. The first thing you should do is ask your, uh, the project that you'll be working with, hey, where, where, do you, where do you have your private keys? How do you handle those? And that's an unusual question to ask oftentimes by auditors out there. And with that, let's subscribe to the newsletter uh, to keep track of more updated numbers and more compromises. And I'll open it up to the questions. Thanks, Peter. That was fantastic. And it's actually the first time I've seen numbers like that put together. It almost looks like we could have a OWASP top 10 from that list. Um, I'll start with one question. The actual hacks that do occur, do you notice any pattern in terms of the contracts have been on chain for only a short time or a very long time and escape notice uh, before they're hacked? Or is it more of a function of the TVL that the hackers are after? Maybe they, they don't care how long it's been on chain and they just look based on TVL. It's a great question. I don't have that data, um, but that would be a great uh, thing to look for. But we can make a guesstimate. Like the majority of hacks, at least the most painful ones are bridges. And it feels like a lot of those bridges, they've been out there for at least from a few months to uh, at least a year. 
Um, I'm thinking back to wormhole. How, how long was wormhole deployed before it was compromised? It was a few months. Nomad, they introduced um, this uh, extra code was post audit, also a few months. So there's definitely, uh, I guess, an element of, if a project has been sitting there for for at least a year or more, <laughs> that is more likely chance of surviving those attacks. Um, so obviously projects which are newer or even if they went through an audit, but they started modifying and making changes, that's the nomad scenario, then they're more likely, not just tar everyone is targeted. We don't know because like a lot of those targets are, can happen off offline. We oftentimes don't see live exploitation, um, but I guess successful attacks that we do see tend to be newer projects with either newer audits that later on were modified. Makes sense, and then, thanks. And then I would also think, um, yeah. Yeah. We have a question uh, with bridges, are they usually more web three hacks, smart contract bugs or web two hacks? Um, let me think back, like, so the, the first two that come to mind uh, in terms of like private key theft, private key theft is, and the reason why North Korea here is involved, it was confirmed, is that's, that's their tactic. You know, we discussed tactics, TTPs in the very beginning. And their tactic is usually sending a phishing email and um, just getting, getting uh, taking over a developer box working their way through to something that stores private keys and then off they go. And that's what they've been doing with exchanges for years. So now they are redirecting their sites onto DeFi projects because that's where the money is. And then, then you have other compromises like the Nomad and the Binance Smart Chain um, uh, hub. And those are smart, I would say 50-50 right now. Um, at least the ones that I can think of immediately. Another question we have, what's the safest way to deal with private keys? Does it mean that we're safe if we use multi-sig for protocol governance? Or do you suggest fully decentralized on-chain governance for DeFi protocols from day one? Uh, again, it's a, it's a tricky, it's a tricky scenario. Let's say from day one, you go into full DAO mode. Well, there are governance attacks. People, I think uh, even Maker, Maker DAO itself was there were attempts to target it by flash loading a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of tokens and using it to force a governance vote. So if you're a newer project and you don't have your token distribution in line, then that could be dangerous just as well. And multi-sig, again, how do you set up that multi-sig? Do, uh, do you truly have multiple developers or multiple trusted parties? And are those, um, like, do you have a two out of three multi-sig, which is definitely not enough? Uh, or do you create a multi-sig, which is so large, then you can have a potential for people leaving and now you cannot even uh, do anything with the protocol. And are those keys, how are those keys generated? How are they managed? Um, I think maybe going full DAO at first is not the best way. It's good to start maybe slightly more centralized. That seems to be the advice. And then just making sure that you're, you have a solid policy and private key management and risk management of like how many keys you want to distribute to who and how many it's going to take to uh, make an act, enact an action. And then you can do other controls. Um, like look at Aave is doing. They have delays and other checks and balances. So even if there is something really strange going on, uh, they have a concept of guardians. So they can basically cancel a governance action if it's obviously malicious. So you can, you can build a more complex system. Um, any other questions? Well, if no one else has one, I'm going to jump in here again. 
this is engineer. And I, I was just wondering, uh, since you're talking about um, different defenses like on Aave, uh, have there been any examples of good monitoring solutions? I feel like uh, most protocols, at least as far as I can tell, don't do much monitoring of the protocol. Uh, I could be mistaken here. Yeah, I think uh, what Florida is doing is awesome. Like they're building open source monitoring for everyone. Uh, you should check it out just because you you can save from rewriting a lot of code. Um, yeah, it's a, I don't think it's a solved problem yet. Again, like we're, we are in uh, the reason why I always say like, oh, we're in the 1990s of, of, uh, of the web two securities like web two has things like intrusion detection systems and uh, you know ids's and intrusion prevention systems and so on and so on we're just starting to build that stuff now which is awesome to watch so in the meantime i would start with something like Forda, and maybe like it's not that hard to write uh, just a simple transaction parser and just look for specific things that you are interested in, or maybe create a batch shop to periodically query your contracts. Um, like, you know, is my price oracle changing for some reason, or what's my total supply of my token? Is that exploding? Uh, things like that. Uh, Whatever works. I mean, AWS is a standard, so you can write lambdas if you want to. Um, you can write just, uh, I think what's important is not how you implement it and where you host it, just as long as you have something running. And most importantly, that your alerts are actionable. So you need to make sure that you have some kind of workflow that goes to more than one developer, if possible, that wakes them up when there's something happening. So you don't want to get a message from the infamous you up message. You hopefully get a message before the whole world knows or before you're exploited, but at least after the very first exploit, before the copycats show up and drain your protocol completely. I think that's the key. Um, so I'm not sure what the best, well, yeah, like I guess more familiar with like corporate options like pager duty and like those type of things, but if you, if you just send yourself an email and you have an alert on your phone that wakes you up uh, in case something really nasty is happening and then you deal with alert fatigue so you're like really narrowed down to something very important like, hey, like my, uh, my LP, which is drained, there's nothing in there. Wake me up, please. Uh, I think that's the key. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, I guess, well, in case I have more questions, but I just wanted to leave you on a note of why we're doing all of this. Uh, it's, it's an incredibly fun field, don't get me wrong. This is the most fun I had in the security um, ever. Uh, it's a brand new frontier. And just keep in mind, like you'll get tired, you'll get exhausted. There's a lot of hacks and you may get just just tired out of all the stuff happening. But just remember that we're building a brand new financial system. And the benefit of that is immense. And you and each and every single one of you is on that frontier. And it's in your power to make it that it's accessible and it's safe enough that people will trust it and use it. And the benefit to everyone is tremendous. So. Just keep that in mind to keep yourself motivated uh, because uh, when I wake up in the morning, I know exactly why I'm doing all this work. Um, and I hope you'll get inspired to, to do this as well. Thanks, Peter. I'll actually mention there is one more question in the chat. I'll read it out loud for anyone yeah. on the recording. 
can you speak more about function parameter validations? Is there any checklist that we can check for input validation for various types? Uh, do you have any specific exploit off on the top of your head that occurred due to insufficient input validation? Um, let me search for it real quick. Uh, so we're about function parameter validation. Let me think back. I, I guess I can offer, I, I don't recall the exact protocols, but there's been at least one or two examples of like a deserialization attack vector. Uh, so the data can be deserialized in ways that are unexpected, which is similar to a, a Web2 attack vector. Well, I guess I classify a nomad bridge compromise as function parameter validation, um, or part of it, FEG compromise. I'm trying to remember what that was. Um, FEG token. I guess the key is just in terms of preventative, like make sure that you have enough um, validation of what data is supposed to look like. So if you're expecting, um, and also the edge cases, if you're expecting an address in a form field, make sure it's an address and make sure you look for um, something that is well-structured. Um, I'm trying to remember what was the uh, FEG I would I would research this. I'm reading through this uh, Certic blog, so maybe that will refresh your memory as well. I'll post it in the in the chat. Yeah. That's why I think it's also good for, um, if you go to block threads, uh, um, well, the blog post itself, what you can do is you can just search for keywords like function parameter validation or specific exploit, and you'll be able to find it. And I usually reference like blog posts or something that um, gives you more understanding of what happened, and then you can do the research there. Oh, I see. So the vulnerability, an example of parameter validation and FEG in particular, is that there was a method that took user input, which should never be trusted, and it used a path parameter in that method without making any additional checks. And, that, and then the attacker was able to inject a path parameter that would just span the current address, which was the contract. So. Just think of the edge cases and like think think what the bad guys could do. Uh, and it's really hard. That's why they hire auditors is that it's very hard to look for bugs like that if you're a developer because you wrote that thing. So of course it makes sense. Like well, why wouldn't it work? So you need to come in fresh and think like an attacker would and try and poke at things that should not be, should be, try to imagine like what assumptions a developer would make and try to poke holes through that. 